All right, here we go. Yeah, Omar up? Gooding, welcome to Vlad TV. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. Long time fan of your work. You know, most known for your role as Sweet Pea and uh, Baby Boy. Yes, sir. Yes, but, sir. But, you know, been in a lot of other TV shows. <sighs> You know? Started as a TV guy. Started yeah. as a TV. Shout out to John Singleton who saw something and said, let me see if I can make him a movie star. So, oh, yeah. And yeah. Of course, you had the show with my man, Mark Curry. Yes, sir. Let's not forget that. Yes, sir. Hang with Mr. Cooper. Yeah. Well, this is your first time here, so I want to start in the very beginning. Yeah. So you were born in L.A.? Yes. Okay. Pacoima, California. Pacoima, California. Yeah. And it was four kids, right? Uh, three kids. I had a half brother that I didn't meet till I was older, but ah, okay. you know, my father didn't meet him till he was older as well. So it's okay. another, another interview. That's another interview. It's another interview. <laughs> and what I didn't know until actually doing, uh, the research is that your dad mm. was in the group, well, the, the lead singer in the group, mm -hmm. the main ingredient. Yes, sir. With their hit song, Everybody Plays the Fool. Yes, sir. Which I've been listening to like my whole life. Really? Did you see The Joker? The Joker. The Joker, that uh, the 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 last movie that, uh, well, the last rendition of The Joker. Actually, The Joker, that just yeah. came out. That just yeah. came out. Yeah, there's a scene in it uh, where they play my father's song. They play Everybody Plays a Fool. A lot of people didn't catch it. Of course, it was right after he passed, so we caught it, you know. So, but uh -huh. it was deep to hear that. I mean, they play it in its entirety. But The Joker is such an intense movie. You're probably not paying attention to the Everybody Plays the Fool in the background, but we heard it. Huh. But it was a it was an interesting moment. I mean, that's a timeless song. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. just a timeless yeah. hit. And true. Yeah, I mean, when he came out, it was number three on the Billboard charts. Yes. And then they had other hits as well. Yeah. They had uh, Just Don't Want to Be Lonely, which mm -hmm. was number 10. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what was it like to have this lead singer father growing up in the household? Well, that's a very interesting question uh, for the simple fact that my brother is nine years older than me. Okay. Uh, my sister, one year to the day older than him. They share a birthday. Another interview. Uh, by the time I was born, the fame part of it kind of ran. Well, I, the money part of it ran out but not so much the fame. Uh, I didn't find out until just a couple years ago, um, my father did a, what he did is he dictated his entire life to a friend of his, who was also his publicist, a close friend of the family, but he's also a publicist. And him and my mother wrote my father's book that they're trying to get published again, another interview. Anyway, but as I read a lot of the backstory, I found out what happened. I thought that my father just wasn't that good with money and we had to start over again, you know? But uh, during apartheid, 1976, the year I was born, my father went out to South Africa, hmm. which was a big no-no to the people out in the US. You know, yeah. like they didn't want our entertainers going out there. So when he came back, he got blacklisted. Oh. And yeah, and everything dried up. The spins stopped, you know, record spins, record play, all that interviews, everything stopped for him. And he had to start back over. But we lost a lot, a lot of houses, finances. We went on a road. We were homeless for a while. My brother started out as an actor and then I followed suit. Right. And your brother is Cuba Gooding Jr. Yes, sir. Named after your dad. Yes, sir. Right. Who yeah. is an Academy Award winner. Yes. Uh, for his role in uh, Jerry Maguire. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. So. Because at one point, you know, as I was going through your history, mm -hmm. your family actually became homeless. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what happened. Um, once we lost the money, uh, my father, uh, my father was born in Harlem. My father and mother, both Harlemites, they'll proudly say anytime you ask them. My brother and sister born in the Bronx. Then five years later, they moved to California. Then the money Dried up. Like I said, he went to Africa, came back, no gigs, you know, record sales, whatnot. And uh, then five years later, I was born. OK, um, so my father, when everything kind of hit the fan for him, he said, I had to I have to go chase this money. You know, Papa was never home. I always joke about it. Papa was rolling stone. But that was you no, know, those facts like he was gone. He was always, you know, out looking for it. You know what I'm saying? So since we were in California, home for him was Harlem, was New York. You know what I mean? So he left to chase that while my mother, my brother and my sister and I moved in with my mom's parents in the high desert. And we stayed there for about a year or two until my grandpa said, look, you got to go. You got to take the kids. You got to make something happen for yourself. And my brother always, always wanted to be an entertainer, you know, an actor specifically. Went to class for it, blah, 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 hence the Husker. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the journey getting there was a long one. We slept in the car, uh, Bobcat with a, with, three kids and a Great Dane. I don't know if you know what a Great Dane is, but that's oh, a very yeah. big dog. Yeah. So to have a Great Dane and us, it felt like it was four kids, you know what I mean? And um, and then he died while we were on the road, just, you know, living conditions and whatnot. We were living in a hotel at the time. My brother had to carry him to a dumpster and throw, like it was, it was rough. Um, but they kept it light for me, you know what I mean? Like it's different 
if you interviewed my brother or sister and asked them about it, I'm sure they'd be way more detailed and the awful and the sadness and all this where it's all I knew. So I was like, we get to move around. We could sleep in our car and then sleep in the house and I get new toys every day. And then we had to throw them in and you got to rent my note. We running out. The, you know what I mean? It was like an adventure for me. So I was always smiling and bubbly, um, which kind of led to, to my success uh, as a child actor with this smile that I had. And thank God my parents taught me to articulate and speak clearly. They never did baby talk with me. So I always had good, clear diction. And that helped me land roles at an early age. They'd see me and go, oh, I go, this black kid, let me see. And, he, and I'd start speaking and they go, oh, wait, yeah, okay, wait a minute, keep the camera rolling, you know? And then I booked a show called Wild and Crazy Kids. My mom was able to quit her two jobs. Hang on, Mr. Cooper came after that. Then smart guy, then baby oh, boy. Okay. You know? But I don't want to jump ahead. I know yeah, no, I want to get into it. <laughs> so, so your brother was the first one to really pursue Absolutely. entertainment. Absolutely. Right? He was taking acting lessons. You guys actually moved um, to, to Luca Lake, I think? Yeah, that's where we... I think we were no longer homeless by the time we got to, <laughs> to look Lake. Okay. That was when we found an apartment. Other than that, it had been hotel, 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 uh, sheepfold, shelter. You know, um, my mom was Christian. She had she got saved when I was born. So we would pray and sing in the car, pray and sing. And she would, you know, we stayed at the Christian uh, shelter, the sheepfold. Um, but then when she finally got a job at uh, Broadway, then she could afford an apartment. And that's where Toluca Lake happened. Aha. Uh-huh. So... Your brother's taking it seriously. He's taking acting lessons. Mm-hmm. And is he landing gigs like early on? Yeah, he had some success, man. I mean, he he did a lot of TV shows, 227, Amen. Uh, remember MacGyver? He actually landed a spinoff called The Colton Brothers. And that like went maybe a season or maybe like the pilot rev the cases and they didn't finish that out. But yeah, he was getting he was getting a little work here and there. You know what I mean? Um you see Coming to America. I know people talked about this. He was the kid sitting in the chair that Eddie Murphy was cut. Oh, right. That was right, him. Right, right. He had a whole scene that yeah. they cut out the movie. Right, because he wasn't actually, he was like pretending to cut his hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was exactly. Like, he was like snipping, but there was nothing actually, no yeah. hair coming out. I remember, but isn't that wild? Right. I mean, the actual scene played out where at the very end, he cuts a chunk out of his hair because he says he left his wallet at home. And he said, all right, we get the rest of your hair when you come back with your wallet. And he runs out, but they wound up just cutting that out of the movie. Mm. So he's smiling the whole time because he's like, my line's coming, my line's coming. <laughs> you know what I mean? It never comes. And then you sit there in the movie theater going, I'm sure why, oh, damn. So, <laughs> which just happens to a lot of actors when they first come out. So it's great. Okay, and I guess you were like running errands for your brother. Yeah. That's when you got discovered? Yeah. Well, it was just a simple thing. Like he pulls up to the front, you know, Omar, go run into my agent and grab this script for me. And I run in and grab it. It's just the first time she saw me, a little kid smiling and beaming. I'm here to pick up a script for my brother. And she's like, goodness, you are, you are bubbly. You have a lot of in- energy, you know? How would you like to be an actor? And I was like, the funniest is so wild because I'd never thought about being, I'm nine, you know what I mean? I think it was probably eight at the time. And I remember watching Star Search, not kids Star Search, but regular Star Search. And they had a section for kids and two kids came out and they sat at a table and looked across each other and spoke hey, hello how are you today da, da, da. and they got up and walked off and they were like next that was a great scene from blah 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 how many stars did they get and i was like that's acting and that's like the only thought i had of, of being a kid but i remember looking going i could do that so she gave me a shot you know no training no classes i think i was in a couple talent shows before then if anything and um i went on an audition for Two things in one day. One was like for some TV show. I don't even remember the name, but I know it was, I was terrified. It was in a high rise building. Everybody knew their lines. I'm shaking, you know. And then later on that day, I had another audition for um, an industrial film uh, for McGruff the Crime Dog. And I wound up booking it, you know. So I was just like, okay, two. <laughs> a lot of people take forever before they land their first thing. I had two in one day and then wound up booking one. Um, so, yeah. So for me, I was, I was bitten early. McGruff the, McGruff the crime dog. McGruff the crime dog. You're the police, like yeah. basically <laughs> from jump. <laughs> you're the feds. From jump, from off, off rip. I almost think I was telling on somebody, there's somebody exactly. trying to sell drugs. <laughs> you're so snitching funny. from the start. Yeah, snitching from the start. Say no. Okay, and now you're in the game. Now mm. you got your first official booking. Right. And your mom becomes your manager. Yes, my momager. Yes, early. Yes. There we go. Okay, now you're off to the races. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess your first TV role was Webster? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. That was the first, my first taste of auditioning. And uh, it's funny to me because I didn't have anyone to kind of tell me this is what you do. And my brother was already trying to do his own thing, but it was me and my mom. And she's like, we got to do something special to stand out. So I remember when I auditioned for this role, uh, it was for an episode called The Web Touchables, where all of the 
characters in the in the show play grown-ups like the untouchables wear little mustaches and whatnot and we're shooting pies out of a gun and whatnot so for the audition i just played the announcer welcome to the sammy club this is such and such and such and such and um you know we what we did was we took a microphone that had the cord stuck it in my little jacket and when i showed up for the audition they said all right what's your name Omar Gooding." Said, okay all right ready and action and i pulled this microphone out of my pocket the cord is the floor and, I, and now and they all start laughing and falling on the floor and I booked it, you know, and that let me know early that you got to do something creative. You got to stand out in some kind of way, especially if you look at the role and it tells you we want this, this, this. OK, you walk in the audition room, you see all these kids looking the same way. Let's change it up. Do something. You know what I mean? So. um, So, yeah, no, that was that was that was definitely fun, man. But that was the first big one for me. Yeah, Webster. Well, and then after that, you got a role in the movie Ghost Dad mm -hmm. starring Bill Cosby. <laughs> <laughs> His name was gold back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was all baby back then. Back then Bill baby. Cosby was the was the height of the height. Man, and that's and you know it's so funny. Every 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 everything you bring up has a story behind it. This is I'm gonna speed this one up for you. When I auditioned for Ghost Dad, I remember Sidney Portier was there, and it was the longest audition I've ever had in my life. He had me crawling on the floor and standing on the table, and he was like, "Now come around the corner. I want to see fear, fear." You know, and I'm like, "Yeah," and I'm scared, and I'm falling, and fake fainting, and all this stuff. And when I left. I just remember thinking, I know I booked that. I mean, I was in there forever. And they called and told my uh, told my mom that I didn't get it. And I talked to her and I said, this is crazy. I don't know how I went through all of that. And they had me crawling and doing all this stuff. I just knew I booked it. She's like, yeah, well, let me find out, which was, you know, odd. You know, usually you, whatever the agent says, they say. But she calls down there and speaks to one of the casting directors about it. And then they just like brief hold came back. And they're like, you know what? We'll bring him back in one more time. Mm. And they brought it, that never happens. Yeah, you know I mean, I don't advise people to try that. But then again, you know, it worked out. And uh, that wound up screen testing. And then they were like, you yeah, know, you're right. And then he books the job. Imagine that. Right. And Sidney Portier was the director. Absolutely. Of that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that movie didn't do all that well. No, no. That was the <laughs> tail exactly. end of Bill Cosby's, <laughs> right. you know, run in movies. I think he did like Leonard Part Six or something like oh, that. Yeah. And then Ghost Dad. And it was just like, another, ah. another stinker. Yeah, yeah another stinker. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any interesting Bill Cosby stories while while working on it? Not really. I mean, he, for him, for me, it was just I've seen all the Cosby shows, and I'm a super big fan, and I'm nervous as hell. But I do remember the first day he walked up. We were filming outside, and it was like the scene where I walk up with the bike, and he was just talking so casually and so nice and warm that it just I, it, all of the jitters just went away immediately. So um, <laughs> funny thing is that's that's as far as that goes. As far as I was filming, everything I thought was great, but you know what's crazy? I was doing a dive put together a documentary. Again, another video, another interview. Uh, and I talked to my brother about being interviewed for my documentary. And he told me a story that my mom also told me. And I thought, you know, you're getting old. That didn't happen. And she said, you, you should tell, if your brother's going to be in your doc, he needs to tell you about the story that happened on Ghost Dad. And I'm like, what was it? So I talked to him. He said, oh man. So he, he explained what happened was he comes to me while I'm filming and he goes, oh, hey man, you're doing great. I think you should smile. And all of a sudden, Sidney Portier yells across, Stop talking to my actor. What is wrong with you? Get off the stage now. Now I want you out of here. And the PA walks him all the way to my trailer and he has to sit there for the rest of the time. So I was like, damn, are you serious? He's like, you don't remember that? I'm like, no, I don't. I honestly don't. But obviously it's something he never forgot. And I'm like, well, I'm sure that came full circle one day. And yes, you know, when he got his Oscar, they took the nice Oscar picture with him and Sidney Poitier and right. Denzel. So. Yeah. Uh, Portier never directed after that. That was pretty much his last. Was that it? I think that was I it. Didn't yeah, know that. That didn't was know. it. <laughs> so that, what else? And you know, uh, I mean, Sydney's a, a legend. Yeah, an absolute legend in this business. Right. Well, when you look at what happened to Bill Cosby right. these days, I mean, he just had his uh, sentence, uh, you know, reversed. Right. But you know, there's still the stigma. Yeah. You know, all the you know all the women that the, the literally dozens of women that accused him of, of yeah. rape and so forth. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I mean, that, it's like I said, the damage is done, you know, and that's the shame of it all that an accusation alone mm -hmm. can uh, stick with you forever. Um, I've spoken to a lot of people that knew him. Um, I've heard mixed things from the beginning, just keeping it 100. And, you know, at first it was just like, you know, the hell out of here. Right. Like, yeah, right. You know, you always get that. Why would he type of thing? But at the end of the day, I don't know him. I don't I'm not his, <laughs> you know, anything. You know, we work together. Sure. But uh, I don't know what happens behind closed doors. I can't speak for another human. Um, the fact that they reversed it, I think that makes it worse than anything. Like, yeah, look, if you got him sentenced, that's what it is. Fine. Oh, it's great that they're, they're letting him out now. But now it's like, damn. So you mean he was innocent? Like, you know, so 
But like you said, the stigma's there, so it is what it is. It is what it is. So then after that, you got on the Nickelodeon show, mm -hmm. Wild and Crazy Kids. Yeah. And you were the host. Yeah, yeah. It was one of three hosts. That uh, was my drive uh, for the audition of that show was to get my mom off of her feet, so to speak. She worked at a department store. She stood in heels all day selling dresses and this and that and sales. And she always prayed, one day I'll get off of, um, I'll, I'll stop working here and I'll get a better job, Nordstrom's. <laughs> right? She would pray this like a mantra every day. And then finally she got a job at Nordstrom. Then she said, one day you'll land a regular series and I'll be able to quit and become your manager. You know, and this was like a dream type of thing. And, you know, for the audition, I, you know, obviously I would keep that in mind. Um, but just having a lot of energy, like I said, being able to speak well and articulate, reading all those lines. And, you know, the audition was wide open. Ethnicity, range, it didn't matter. So. I knew I just had to be one of the best in order to, to book this thing. And uh, it worked out, man. And it was it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Three years of that, 25 episodes. It was like 75 total, you know. I think the first two seasons, it was fun as hell. And by the third season, well, I'm now but about 14, 15 years old. It felt like work. So it was, it was fun as hell. But at the same time, I was like, what's next? Yeah, and you were pretty much the breadwinner of the family at this point, right? At that point, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, because it's like, you know, my father... Like I said, the money left, he left. He went chasing. He would, you know, we'd see him and he'd come in holidays and this and that and the third and so forth. And my parents, they broke up and whatnot, blah, blah. But then my my brother becomes the man of the house type of thing. But this, you know, it's a couple years. And then he had to go chase his thing. And then he got married. So he had to su he had to support them. So now, yeah, it's just me and my sister and my mom. So, yes, I was definitely the breadwinner of the house. Okay. And then in 1991, mm -hmm. Boys in the Hood comes out. Yeah. Starring. Your brother, yes, sir. Cuba Gooding Jr. What's interesting is that uh, I interviewed Tyron Turner. Nice. You know, who played Kane in Absolutely. Men's Society. That. And he actually auditioned for that same role. Did he really? And he even did like a whole like reenactment <laughs> of, of Cuba Gooding's, uh, you know, like that is you know, the part when he was like, you know, comes home, starts punching. And he starts the punching. And okay. I thought he improv that too. So that's amazing that he has that. Story. Hold on. I'll actually show you. Let me, see, <laughs> let me see if I can pull this up. He said that was in the audition, huh? Got it. So this is Tyron Turner talking about his audition for Boys in the Hood. Mm -mm. You actually tried out for Boys in the Hood. I tried out for Boys in the Hood. I did the whole spiel, went in there, met John Singleton. You know, I, I remember like yesterday, I, I went in there and I, it was the scene where, uh, you know, when uh, Cuba got it, he got on time. <laughs> 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 Damn, okay. You, At least we know, right now there. we know why he didn't get the role. <laughs> you put me right into that scene <laughs> right, right there. And I did that whole little thing and John did Singleton you? was like. <laughs> so there you go. He's such a nut. <laughs> ah, I was like, yeah, well, that would have been easy to cast. I get it. I get it. But the next, <laughs> anybody else out there, send in Cuba. Right. And this is John Singleton's first job. You know, it was his first, mm -hmm. you know. That was his first breakthrough, yeah, breakout. his first breakthrough, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, breakthrough uh, director yeah. uh, position. Yeah. You know, when that came out, you know, and that co-starred uh, Ice Cube, mm -hmm. that was his acting debut as well. Yes, sir. You know, when that came out, it made such a big splash. Yeah. Especially in the hip hop world. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh shit, Ice Cube, the yeah. rapper is acting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yo, this is a movie based in LA showing like LA life. You never really saw anything like that before. No, no, you didn't. Uh, John Singleton was good for that, man. I mean, he would take people from other genres. Uh, if you're a rapper or you're an unknown or you're a TV show <laughs> comedian, and then make them reputable A-list or actors. You know what I'm saying? So um, that was his niche, man. He he like the way he saw me in Baby Boy blew my mind. He said, I, I saw you on a show, at doing a movie, and you made one expression, and I said, boom, you can do this role. And I'm like, what the fuck? He had no idea about my history and how I grew up and whatnot, so forth. So uh, so yeah, man, he he was able to change the game multiple times. Yeah. And when Boys in the Hood came out, and suddenly your brother who's, like I said, the star of the movie. Yeah. Did that really inspire you? Uh, by that time, I was already in it, you know? So it didn't, it it wasn't like, oh man, I got to take this serious now. I was taking it as seriously as I could at that time. Yeah. Um, him, you know, I think as he was filming it, it was just like, oh wow, this is cool. Like, can I go to the set? Cool. I remember I met Ice Cube. Fucking terrifying. Uh, he didn't <laughs> smile. It, it was, yeah. We were all scared of Ice Cube back then. Let me tell you. Uh, the damn. NWA days of Ice Cube was like, you <laughs> yeah. can tell me he's not the, the biggest mass murderer on the planet. Right, exactly. Like, that guy. like me? Cut. 
<laughs> we're not even filming right now. Yeah, no, he was he was crazy. But um, but yeah, you know, it was kind of just like you know, every day, you know, people ask me. It's kind of like the general question: How was it to grow up with the father and this and the brother? And I was like life. It was normal to me. Nothing seemed, oh my God, I can't believe this. You know, I've seen my father perform on big stages and crowds and watching the crowd and the women and all that going, why? Like, yeah, that's him. I'll see him backstage. You know, my brother at that moment, it was cool. I mean, at that time it did well in the box office. I can see it going. I can see his finances changed, his houses changed, like, you know what I mean? So, so it was definitely uh, inspiring. Like it was never a negative you know what I mean? To have Cuba Gooding Jr., your brother, especially since I was an actor as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of tragedy around that movie in terms of the cast. Absolutely. Um, guy played Dookie, I think. Yeah. Got killed. Yeah. Yeah. And the guy who shot Ricky, mm -hmm. uh, he had a crazy story. I don't yeah, know. These if you were heard actual that. live uh, gangbangers. Like, yeah, this exactly. he wasn't hiring actors for all of these roles. And yeah. That, you know, like, yeah. He, he, he went chose. to jail, I think, for murder. Yeah. And then I think his cellmate murdered him. Damn, was that how he Yeah, happened? that's how Ricky I know died. he died in jail. Yeah, in real life. Yeah. That's what happened. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's yeah. a crazy story. My, my yeah. friend QD3 actually was really good friends with him and told me like, the whole really? breakdown. Yeah, his, his idea was he was going to be the first rapper who really goes to maximum security and comes out. Oh, shit. But it didn't work but, out. But yeah, he, didn't he just went to maximum out. security and never, never left. Damn, that's wild. Yeah. So, okay. So then 1992, you get your role on Hanging with Mr. Cooper. Mm -hmm. How was that? That was dope, man. I mean, um, for me, the ride, it was just, it was nonstop because Wild and Crazy Kids ran for three years. And then right when it ended, I auditioned for Hanging with Mr. Cooper and booked that and started up like in the same calendar year. You know what I mean? So it was three years of that and then five years of hanging with Mr. Cooper. I remember I was in, um, back then, I'm, they don't do it so much now, but what, it started with a presentation. So they had the script, they had the cast. Uh, we shot the presentation. It got picked up as a pilot. Then we reshot the pilot. And then once that got sold, we started the first season on that. And I was uh, what they call seven out of 13. I wasn't in every single episode from the beginning. I wasn't a series regular on that show until the fourth and fifth season. But for the first three seasons, I was, it was kind of off and on and I was still in high school. So it was still, I still felt really normal. You know what I mean? Believe it or not. Yeah, wild Crazy Kids, met Arnold Schwarzenegger and all the different situations and, and, hang, and hang with Mr. Cooper with everything that I went through on and off through that, it's still, you know, I'm still going to high school. You know? And I guess right around that time, you started taking rap a little more seriously? Sure, sure, sure. Um, it's interesting because with rap music, I remember writing my first rap when I was in, I think, fourth grade, <laughs> you know, and I remember folding it up in the paper and reading it in the playground with sixth graders, you know, I'm looking up at these guys and doing my rap and they're like, all right, little man, you know, that type of thing. But it was always more like a hobby because I was so busy with acting. Um, but yeah, like right around high school, you know, uh, especially going to a public school, not a private school. Um, a lot of things happened culturally for me. Like, you know, I would hang with just about anybody up until that point. But then in high school, I kind of saw factions and different like right, the black guys over here, the jocks are over here. You got the white kids here, the Mexicans here, da, 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 that type of thing. And a lot of the black dudes, we was there in the circle. We was rapping, you know what I mean? So I had like a little clique that formed that we was, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which later kind of turned into other things. But that's, <laughs> I'll wait for you to ask about that. Okay. And I guess you would actually put together some demos. And in the demos, you didn't swear. At all. There's no profanity. Because <laughs> I guess your mom wasn't going for that. Ah, yeah, man. I mean, it, the demos that we, you're exactly right. And, uh, but do you know what really happened was we performed a lot in the circuits out here in Hollywood. Um, do you remember the Budweiser Best of the Fest? Yeah. <laughs> Budweiser Best of the West? Yeah. Best of the West. Yeah. Best of the West. So we performed in that a couple of times. I think we got like third or fourth. We performed. Remember we were at, um, it was competed, I should say, rather than performed. But we performed. And a lot of times they would tell you not to swear. So we learned how to sound like we were swearing without using cuss words. You know what I mean? Believe it and people would hear us and be like, damn, I didn't even hear. I thought y'all was cursing. Like, can we get the radio version? I'm like, oh, there ain't no curse words in that. They were like, damn, how did y'all pull that off? And it just became a thing that we would do. So, you know, and again, yeah, you're right. My mom was managing me. So like, yeah, don't swear around mom's type of thing. My mom and my dad actually divorced and remarried when I was around 18 years old. But he started, you know, I keep moved back in type of thing. And that kind of rubbed off. So he would 
take us around and try to get us in the business. He said, why don't you guys incorporate singing? I'm like, yeah, because we rappers. We don't sing. You know what I mean? And he was like, yeah, I can teach y'all how to sing. I'm like, imagine that. And he was so good. The, at the beginning, it was like, you hit this note, you hit this note, you hit this note. Okay, that was terrible. Do it like this. Again, again, again. And by after 15, 20 minutes, he had us sounding like we were a group that could harmonize. It was amazing. So we would mix that in with some of our rap type of thing. And um, I remember he got us an audition for uh, John Sally. My friend. Yeah. Regular, and, regular guest on Vlad TV. Really? And John, I don't know if he remembers this. I, I would be shocked if he He does remember, remember because I actually texted him this Did morning. Did you? Yep. Oh, okay. I texted I'm him this so morning. surprised. Yep. And his ear was dope because, you know, he was like, all right, what y'all got? And we were in there, you know, we rapping and we, the way we look, it looked like some street, you know what I mean? And he was like, not bad, guys, not bad. But I did notice that you guys didn't swear. You had, he called them swear runs. You had no swear runs. We were like, what does that mean? So you didn't curse at all. And we're like, oh, yeah, yeah. We smiled about it. It's like, yeah, he said, yeah, yeah. You ever think about going gospel? And that was when it was like, do, do, do. <laughs> you know, it yeah. was like, well, thanks for coming in. You know, it was great to meet you. Loved you playing basketball. You, bet, you know, so we took that some kind of way. And I swear that kind of ended the no cursing for me as a rapper for sure because I was like damn so if you ain't if you ain't cursing then you gospel now don't get it twisted like I said my mother got saved when I was born so you know I'm a born again Christian I, I get it I even in my music now a eh, little bit people don't like to be preached at but they also don't mind hearing a good lesson if it's there but sometimes you just got to do it right so the 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 beef I have with going gospel is if I was going to preach and try to preach the word of God to people. Why do it only to gospel people that already hear it? You understand what I'm saying? I'm not going to do Christian rap for Christians. So if I was going to try to save some people, it would probably be people that maybe haven't heard the word of God. So I need to go secular. And then, you know, if you ask me, I'll tell you about my faith type of thing, but I wouldn't push it on people. That's kind of like my, my difference in my thinking as far as gospel. Yeah. Well, you know, I hit him about, you know, I, I saw a passage <laughs> about, this whole this right, whole situation he goes yeah he goes I remember he goes I I, I remember a little bit differently but he okay. said he knew that gospel was going to move into rap mm. already and when you look at these days you know I've interviewed guys like Lecrae who are huge yeah in that world they make tons of yeah. money because yeah. you know <laughs> he said it in a way like you said that made it oh okay it wasn't like man y'all are terrible do gospel rap no, no no he was just like have you ever thought about it. But as soon as the words came out, everything sounded like wah, 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 wah. <laughs> but yeah, he made some good points. He's like, I'm telling you, you can make some good money. You can do this and do that. For me, I wasn't in it for the money like that. I love music. The music is in me, still is to this day. And I was just like, nah, I want to be on the radio. I want to be on this radio. I don't want to be on, well, if you tune to this or if you find it on here. You know what I'm saying? As, as all kids uh, did at that time. So did you know any other like established rappers? You know, you'd mentioned you had met Ice Cube and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, up until what point? At that time? No, no, not really. No, later no, no. on. I mean, yeah, later on a lot. Like when I did Baby Boy, then yeah, that's when I met Snoop Dogg and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. But at that time, no. Okay. And then right around that time, you worked on the show Thea. <laughs> yeah, Thea. <laughs> and you said that Thea was a nightmare. Yeah. He ever doubt. You know, so the, the, the thing about stuff like that is you'll hear, oh, they're 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 terrible to work with. Good luck. Have fun on that or try to this and that, blah, 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 blah. And the wild thing was she was cool as shit to me. But I saw how she treated everybody else. And I was just like, oh, that's happened to kind of a lot in my career. Have you ever met so-and-so? They're an asshole. And I'm like, yeah, I've seen him be an asshole, but we cool. You know, I remember she stuck up. She took up for me. When they had me in like some suit that was super tight, she's like, why you got this boy dressed like that? He looked like a such and such. And she used such colorful language. I was just in there like, oh, shit. But, you know, some people are hard to work with. I don't know how. They, some people are good at auditioning. They sell themselves to be this and that. And as soon as you get to know them, you find out, oh, that might And that's. Well, the show lasted, I believe. For, show lasted for one season. I don't even think it lasted a season. Like they told him <laughs> towards the end of the season, this is it. Like, you know what I mean, enjoy this next check or two, but it's on its way out. Okay. Yeah. Well, then shortly after that, 1995, you get And that was starring Jason Weaver. Jason Weaver. Oh, he yeah. was in it. Jason oh. Weaver was in Thea. That's okay. what I thought that's what you were getting at. That's ah. where we met. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. Jason Weaver. Shout yeah. out to the homie. Jason Weaver was That's what it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, then in 1995, shortly after that, you get arrested. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I'm going to I'm gonna read the police report. All I'm right. Gonna, you know, not the actual police report, mm -hmm. but what the media was reporting yeah, at yeah. that time. Gotcha. That TV actor Omar Gooding and two friends were arrested on suspicion of carrying loaded guns while driving and receiving a stolen firearm. 
Uh, I guess they were cruising in a black Ford Bronco around sunset. Uh, they were booked for possession of a loaded firearm in a public place, receiving a stolen firearm. And I guess at the time that you guys were being arrested, a bunch of people were crowding around and started throwing rocks at the cop car yeah. and broke one of the cop car's windows. Yes. So explain to me why this successful young man who's getting movies with Bill Cosby and is on Nickelodeon and, and so forth, rolling around with a stolen gun. Well, two ways to answer that. First way is this. In my opinion, um, I always stuck with my day ones. I always hung out with friends of mine. I didn't make friends all the time. I didn't think that you know, I, and I like to go out. I always like to go out. You know, people see me now like, damn, what are you doing out here? I'm like, what? I can't be, you know, where you guys are. I can't just hang out. Where's all your security in the entourage? I'm like, I'm good. I'm good, right? Yeah, okay, you know. And then it was a little bit, it was more. You know, I like to rap. So when we rap, we go out, we go out as a group. We'd hang as a, as a, as a gang, so to speak. You know what I mean? But I always said if, if anything hit the fan, you know, I'm always down to fight and I need people that have my back. I'm not going to hang out with actors that I don't know if they've ever been in the streets before and hope they got my back when bottles start flying, you know what I mean? Which they flew more than people know. Um, so, you know, again, like the people that are hung around and what I'm sure we'll get to later with baby boy and that whole situation. And where did that all come from? These were people that I knew that I met in the streets through music. You know, it started as rap. And it just kind of evolved into that. Some guys, if you grew up on Crenshaw, you know, friends that grew up in Compton and whatnot, they were affiliated. They might not have been active gangbangers, but if you're in that element, you're in that element. I know we went somewhere and somebody had a gun. And I was like, well, where are we all out here? Why ain't we got no guns? He's like, well, let's buy some guns. And then it turned into, you know, since I had the money, it was like, I wouldn't just get registered guns. It was always like, yeah, I got a gun for sale. You want to buy this one? Damn, that's nice. I'll take that. Oh, I got a friend that's got a couple. You want to come get these from him? Sure. Fine. I got my. 10 guys that roll with me, you know what I mean? I might as well get 10, 15 guns, you know what I mean? And it just one thing led to another. I would just buy it. And what happened was the guns that we got pulled over with had the serial number scratched off so they couldn't trace them. So they figured, oh, they must be stolen. I'm like, well, why would we steal a gun? No, we didn't steal none. I got money, you know? And um, that night, what happened, we were driving around. I had, uh, I actually had three guns in the car and four, <laughs> three other friends with me. We pull up to a nightclub. And uh, I hop out the front. All right, valet. How much is valet? He said, that'd be $50. I kind of looked at him like, excuse me? You know, for one, he's like, well, you got it. You got it. And I'm like, that's not the point. How much is everybody else paying? They paying $50. I said, you know who I am type of thing. And were, it was brief, but it was a little bit of like, man, whatever. We'll just go park on the street. Damn all that. You know, I'm saving my money for drinks, that type of thing. So I hop back in the car and we circle the block looking for a spot. And uh, one of my friends had already gotten out. He's like, I'll wait here. So when I circled back to the front, I noticed... A cop car got behind me, but I didn't think much of it. Uh, I made two U-turn, well, two turns, like, because we went all the way around. Right turn, right turn, right turn. Every time I turned the block, it seemed like another cop car got behind it. So by the time I pulled up to the front, I saw my friend stand. I said, come on, man, hop in. We getting out of here. And he looked behind me and saw all the cop cars and was like, no, nah, I'm good, man. I don't think I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay, you know, <laughs> true story. So we closed the door. We drive maybe two, three feet, and boom, the, the, the sirens go off. Driver, pull over, turn the engine off, throw the keys out. Uh, passenger, exit the vehicle, turn around, turns around, walks forward to handcuff him. Next one, back seat, get out. He gets out, step out, hands up, turn around, walk towards us, turn around. All right, boom, boom. Driver, open the door. Driver, get out the car. Driver, back up, hands up. Driver, turn around. And as soon as I turn around, people lose their damn minds. And I'm like, what are they yelling for? Who the... I couldn't even get in the club a second ago, but now you yelling like I'm Tupac or some shit. And they throwing bottles and rocks and we're getting in the back of the car and bam, the bottom. I'm like, what the hell? These dudes are going to beat the hell out of us. And they drive. They didn't stop at the radio, at, at the at the police station. They pulled off into like an alleyway. I'm like, oh, they about to drag us and beat the hell out of us. But they just got out, checked their cars and situation and whatnot. And we made it to the station. We get to the station. They asked me whose gun was it. I'm like, it's my gun. It's my car. It's my gun. They're like, oh, you actually claimed the guns. Yeah. I said, well, this is how <laughs> I said gun. They said, we found a gun in the car. They said, where is the gun? I was like, it's under the mat. They found the gun, right? They had all three of us in custody at first. And um, they said, it's your gun. It's one gun. Fine. We'll let your friends go. So they let them go. However, these dudes weren't too street savvy. They didn't know if the cops let you go, you better get the hell out of the police station. Instead, they in there calling a ride, right? They keep searching my car. They find two more guns. 
So my friend, as he would tell it, he's sitting in the lobby and uh, he said he's waiting on the phone call. Like, hey, you know, use the phone. Man. He hears footsteps coming down the hallway. Boom. The sheriff's is there. Oh, good. You're still here. Thank God. Uh, we found two more guns. You guys ain't going no. So they book all three of us. And, um, you know, the judge later dropped it down. So I think I did like probation. And that was that. Oh, that was it. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't. Okay. No jail time. No, 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 right, jail time. but the news was already out there. And oh, I it was 24 hours of hell. Right, because you were doing Hanging with Mr. Cooper at okay, that point. Hanging with Mr. Cooper. So you had to go show up at the set and I guess apologize to everybody? Yeah, thank God I did. It saved my job, saved my career. Who knows what, what would have happened? But uh, luckily, Mark Curry heard about it and he talked, pulled me, called me over to his house and he said, man, yeah, you got to apologize. You got to man up for this and stand up. I'll go to back for you because I like you, but you got you to gotta do your part. So yeah, so first day, I think that happened on a weekend. So like Monday when I showed up for the table read, like right before it started, no one, like, people weren't looking at me crazy or nothing. It seemed like they were just going to play it off. Like, well, whatever, we don't read the news. And I was like, can I have your attention for a second? No, please stop. Like, go on. And yes, I stood up and apologized for embarrassing everyone. It'll never happen again. Terrible judgment, this and that. And they lined up to hug me and everything, you know, and then everything, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was definitely a, a good move to, to fess up. And I'd be like, oh man, they tripping. They want my guns. No. So there you go. Yeah. Okay, and then the next gig was Smart Guy? Yes, yes. Uh, Danny Kalis was one of the executive producers of Hanging with Mr. Cooper. Now, Hanging with Mr. Cooper was interesting because every year it seemed like we changed executive producers. Now, that's like unheard of. The executive was like the big dog. Why are, you know, like we just talked about Thea. She was a problem. She had to go. Not that Mark Curry was a problem, but whatever it was, they kept changing executive producers or firing, whatever it was. And um, by the end of the last two years, we, um, you know, we had a new one. So one of the executive producers, Danny Kayla, started a new TV show. He said, man, I got a show called um, Smart Guy. I want you to come in and read for the bully. I said, hell yeah, I'll do it. You know, and that bully role wound up being the best friend role as it evolved into a full blown series. Mm. OK, and the show was going well mm -hmm. until the last season <laughs> when I guess one cast member wanted a pay increase and. <laughs> Well, this is, you know, and that's funny because I've talked about this in interviews and it's, it's, it's to be fair. What they did was they paid all of the actors the exact same amount. It wasn't a bad amount, but it was the exact same. We all knew that we were all getting paid the same. And if I'm the lead of a show, you know, if I'm smart guy, it's my show. Why am I getting paid as everybody else? You know, so the only issue, um, that I have with it, I guess, you know, because it is what it is. Everything happens for a reason, right? Um, was how it happened. Now, the how was the issue. The how was, I'm not coming to work this week. Like, we're already filming, bro. Like, you, if you have an issue, we did two seasons already. And I get it. After the first season, they were like, yeah, no, if the show does well, we'll get a pay increase. Second season, no, nah, same thing. We're like, damn, really? They raised it by a little bit, but it was nothing dramatic. Third season, like, all right now. Okay, so you should have just sat out or just made your, 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 you know, stance known before rather than starting the film. Cause what happened was we started filming a couple episodes and then we got the news. So listen, next week, uh, such and such ain't going to be here. So Marcus and Mo, it's going to be a show about you while one guy's off at camp. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> we were like, damn, he ain't showing up. That's a shame. Okay. Where's my script? Where's my, you know, and it wasn't like we made this stance. Like, let's talk about it, man. What do you, do you want to stand with him and this and that? Like, no, nah, we didn't have a beef. We just knew that, you know, we'd have more lines on that week. And we figured, is this how the show's going to go? Is the show over or what? And no, he came back to work the next week and we finished out the season, you know. And it seemed like one of those, well, maybe he just tried something. It didn't work. So be it. No harm, no foul. But, you know, at the end of the season, it's just like, it was, <laughs> we have the normal hug at the party with all the execs. It's, all right, man, you guys are great. I'll see you again next year, right? Crickets. Cricket. <laughs> nope. All right, man, but you be good. All right, I'll be good. That was odd, right? That seemed a little weird, right? Did you notice the pause? Start looking for work. There you go. Mm -hmm. Well, and then that same year, your brother, Cuba Gooding Jr., wins an Oscar. Yes, sir. For best Supporting Actor in his role in Jerry Maguire. Yeah, man. And, you know, at the end of the day, this is the highest honor an, any actor in the world yeah. could get. Yeah. In the world, in yeah. any country, to win an American Oscar. Yeah. It doesn't get any bigger than that. Absolutely. When you saw your brother on that stage mm -hmm. with that trophy, mm -hmm. what did you think? Uh, I was busy being hoarse. It was interesting because I have my own place and uh, I remember we got a knock on the door the day of the Oscars and it was, it, well, I'm sure it was less dramatic and I'm sure they called me first. But they said it was, uh, hmm, 
maybe e Hollywood. I, I'm not exactly sure. But they said, we want to bring in cameras and film your response to your brother um, when they announce who wins the Oscar. And I'm like, well, you're acting like he's going to win already. They're like, no, we got a hunch. <laughs> like we, I was like, all right, fine. But if he doesn't win, y'all better get the hell out of here fast. You know, I'm making jokes with him and whatnot. But that didn't even tip me off. I still had it. Let's just be honest. No, I didn't think he was going to win. The reason why I didn't think he was going to win not because his performance wasn't worthy. And uh, and it was also one of those things when I saw the, the, I think when I went to the premiere, I was a little caught up in the lights. I was just like, not bad, bro. Like, that's what I thought. Like, that was pretty good. I, I saw it again later and was at the end of that movie going, damn, no, that's an Oscar. Like the joy that he pushed through. Show like, me the money. To show me the Oh, man. I was at the end of that movie going, yeah. Like, I, you know, because I watch movies. I get into films. I'm a fan of the craft. So anyway, so. Uh, and, uh, and the other side was Ed Norton. Do you remember that role in, um. That Ed Norton did that same year where he played, uh, damn, what is it called? It's not Kate. It's, it's something. God, I got to think of it. You talking but, about um, when he played a Nazi? No, not that one. I was great. We stepped in the guy's head. No, he had a Fight role. Club? Him and um, Richard Gere. Richard Gere played the lawyer. Ed Norton played the kid that was charged with murder, but he had split personality. Primal Fear? Primal Fear. Primal Fear. If you haven't seen Primal Fear, watch Primal Fear. That was one of those... I think he got snubbed. Like, it was awesome. I don't even want to give away. They, like, the ending is spectacular. And that's who my brother's up against. I think, I want to say they gave him the Golden Globe for that. And then my brother got the Oscar. Um, yeah, I think that's what, because when he got the Golden Globe, I was just like, yeah, man, huh? Well, yay, yeah, bro, at least you got Oscar, you got nominated. Yeah, man, yeah, you know man. And uh, so the cameras are on us. We're all in my living room. We're watching. And yeah, and I wasn't there. I was, I was, I was at home. My mom and my, my, my uh, dad were at the Oscars and his wife, of course. And uh, so we're watching it at home. And all I remember is she said, the war goes cute. And it was her cute. That was it. Nobody else's name started with that. And I, I think I blacked out for a minute. Uh, but it was awesome, man. It, it, it felt like a win for us. Not the Goodings, but us. They didn't give black people a lot of Oscars. True. It wasn't until recently when, the, damn, did five, did five, six people want to, five black people want to Oscar, you know. So then that felt, that was it. It wasn't like, well, you're an actor too. You're next. Or, oh man, the pressure's on. You got to get one. Your brother got one. I was like, no, that's not how Oscars work. <laughs> he got the Oscar. <laughs> I got to go try to get a Grammy or something else. You know what I mean? Because it ain't going to be an Oscar, you know. Um, but pride, yeah, man. And seeing him up there jumping around. That was my brother, man. You know, so yeah, it was a big deal. Dope. Dope. Then in 2001, you get cast for Baby Boy. Yeah. Sweet Pea. Yeah. Uh, Jody's best friend. Yeah, man. Now, did you have somewhat of a a rough background where you can kind of draw from in that role? Because you you were pretty, you were kind of gangster in that yeah. role. I wouldn't even say kind of gangster. You were a gangster yeah, in that he role. Was, he was the gangster's gangster. Right. I mean, like, well, I'll tell the story. The story is, like I said, he called, John Singleton called my mother, who knew managed me, and said, I'm Mrs. Gooding, I made your, your, your oldest boy a movie star. I would like to make your youngest boy a movie star. Can I have his phone number? And he calls me up says that same very thing and says, I have a script for you. It's called Baby Boy. Hit the gym. I'll see you in about three months. And when I read the script, it floored me. Not because of how good it was, but if he gave me the script and said, pick a role, <laughs> regardless of how Tyree's career, my career went or whatever the case is, if he asked me which role I wanted to play, it would have been a no-brainer for me. Now, you know, especially Amy, he's like the hero, you know, um, and the demons that I was able to exercise. Um, so what happened was I got into a situation where it was me, my best friend on the planet, um, and then another buddy of mine. We went to a house party. When we got there, um, it was interesting because it just seemed it was close to the house. So like my friend had on some house shoes. <laughs> like it was so close, like a pool party type of thing. And uh Again, we weren't gangbangers. We didn't, not, not even my best friend wasn't a gangbanger. Affiliated maybe, but it wasn't, that wasn't was what it was. And uh, there was another gang there uh, and they approached us just straight up, hit us up. Where are you from? That type of thing. And I, I was always protective of my guy, but he went the world to me. He was always the loud, just always bum, bum, bum type of thing. So I kind of stood in front of him because he was shorter than me. And I was just like, yo, that's, this, this ain't going to go down like this type of thing. But, you know, for them to be gangbangers, and they were all younger than us. That's what I remember, too. I always remember they, I was like, look at these little dudes. Like, if you don't knock it off, 
what are you going to do type of thing? But they wouldn't, they, the fight didn't just start. They just surrounded us and then separated us. And still, no one threw a punch. They started throwing bottles. So I remember he, a bottle came flying my way and I ducked all the way to the floor to duck it. And I stood up like, you you know, what's happening? We, somebody come up. I'm not just going to charge a bunch of guys. And then I hear, oh, my God, I got him. I got him. And I look over. My best friend's on the floor, motionless. And I run over to grab him. And my other buddy is holding him at the time. And I push him off and I grab him. And he's not responding. The back of my, my hand's full of blood. And his mouth is swelling up. And his blood coming out of his mouth. And, you know, get an ambulance, get an ambulance. And I'm holding him and I'm holding, you know. And, you know, it was me, him, and a friend of mine. And the guy, I remember the guy jumping around saying, I got him, I got him. And he's holding a gun. And um, then they all ran. It's the wildest thing. And I just remember holding him. And then the ambulance came, let him move, sir. Let me get him. They got him. They took him away. And um, there was never any closure. There was no, get the guns, let's ride out. Let's go get these dudes. We're going to find them. Blah, blah, blah. One guy got killed. Another one went to the, went to the hospital. Wait, so did your friend die? Jail. No. Your friend survived? He survived. Okay, so who got killed? Uh, the other side. <laughs> okay, someone on the other side. Yeah, like there was a couple of guys there that were involved. I'm saying I, I, can, I can speak for sure that at least two or three of them are no longer with us, but it didn't happen from us or because of that incident. The guys I found out later were known for starting stuff and this and that and the third. One immediately went to jail and the other one, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, everything that happened to them happened in a window to where, again, we didn't see them again. So that was just something that hung in the back of our minds. My friend came to, of course, he didn't remember a thing. What happened was a guy blindsided him and my other friend saw it. He said, the blind, he blindsided you, bam, hit you with the gun and you just fell straight out. And he landed on the back of his head and was bleeding, you know. But this was my dude. This was, this was my larger than life guy to me. And to see him like that, it, it messed me up. Just, you know, in the sense of you just like, shit, anything can happen to anybody. Your, your invincibility cloak kind of, you know what I mean, kind of goes away type of thing when you see your man laying and you holding him like that. So, and again, I always remember that they were younger. So, um, there's more that I can talk about. I mean, just generally speaking, again, I did grow up. I grew up, I was born, I, used to, I always used to say I was born in Lakeview Terrace, California. And I used to ask, what's your name? Omar Miles Gooding. Where are you from? Lakeview Terrace, California. As I became a man, I saw my birth certificate said Pacoima. I was a Pacoima hospital. Why am I saying Lakeview Terrace? And obviously they're on the border. People know that. But now when people ask me, I'll be like, yeah, Pacoima. Yeah, depending on who asks. So I grew up there. I went to North Hollywood High School. I lived in L.A. I lived here. I lived there. And, you know, I made a few close friends along the way. Some were affiliated, some were not. But I used to go to Crenshaw on Sundays. I've seen a lot. You know what I mean? I've been involved. I've had to duck from bullets. I've had street fights. You know, I got into a street fight. The funny thing is the closure that, in a way, happened was we were talking about how my friend was laid out one day on our way into a club and some other guys started talking crazy to us. And I wound up fighting the dude, like take my shirt off and what's happening? Straight ahead fade and this and that, scrapping on the street and falling down, boom, hit him and up, boom, popped up. You know what I mean? But it wasn't from that. You know what I mean? So anyway, said all that to say, I get this script and I'm reading it. And, you know, I got all this in me that you can't always get out. You know, it's it's it was a release. It was therapy. But I, I had so much bottled up that when I auditioned for John Singleton, you know, I showed up three months later and I'm 24 years old. So I was able to lose weight like that. It was nothing. I was ripped up. I had my <laughs> tick top on. My head was bald. And he was just like, all right, you look good. Let's read. And I read and I remember I'm fired up and I'm kicking chairs and I'm doing all this. And he was just like, cool, cool, cool. Man, hey, man. But. Thanks for you, man. You look good, man. Thanks for coming in, man. I was like, right on. I left and I was like, woo, can't wait to start filming this movie. I didn't hear anything. A couple days, a couple weeks, a whole month goes by. I never heard anything. And then I finally got the call. Mm. So I had forgot about it. And um, when we started rehearsals, this is what John Singleton, what he did is we all go to Lemur Park and we have rehearsals. It's me, uh, you know, Tyrese, Snoop. Ving Rhames, Taraji, everybody there. We do a full cast read and then we do rehearsals for like a week. And through the rehearsal process, he motivates you. I think for the, I, I was kind of cocky that I'd got it. So I felt like I was the shit, but I wasn't showing it yet. And he called me out in front of everybody. 
Like, all right, that was a good rehearsal today. And he looks dead at me and says, but some of us need to step it up. Hmm. All right, I'll see y'all tomorrow. I was just like, what the fuck? So I remember I go home and I'm thinking about it. Obviously, I can't sleep. Can't wait for the next day, man. So I show up that day and I was fired up, man. He said, all right, first exercise we're going to do. Uh, one of you is going to sit in the middle with a chair. The rest of the cast, all in character, are going to ask you questions. But just remember, stay in character, stay in character, stay in character. Who wants to go first? Me. <laughs> Shit, I'm ready. And I've sat there and I remember everybody that asked me anything, I just jumped on them. I wouldn't let them complete a sentence. I was just fired up. Oh, 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 what? Yeah. Oh, because of this, because of that. If it wasn't in the script, I'd make it up. I was just vamping. I was like, well, remember last week when I, you loaned me that money? Hey, meet me last week. Like, try, you lying, motherfucker. Lying what? Bitch, you remember? Like, I was just going off, right? Then we was like, all right, we're going to try something else. How about this scene is this? We'll do word association. I'm yelling in Tyree's face and doing words, word play. We're doing this back and forth. And then, uh, I remember uh, Ving Rhames was there. So, we, you know, obviously we were going back and forth. And every time I say something, I'm like, what? He said, boy, if you don't shit your ass. And I remember I grabbed him. And we fell on the bed and we was wrestling and shit. And I was like, yeah. And I jumped off him. I'm like, punk, you ain't shit. Da, 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 da. Right, right. And and that kept going. I mean, this rehearsal went forever, man. And John Singer, the whole time, he's just holding his camera, just going. He's not never yelling cut. He's like, all right, next scene, do this. And he just keeps doing this. And finally, Ving Rhames is fed the fuck up. <laughs> he's fed the fuck up. <laughs> And I go, uh, I go, uh, I remember we're doing something, we're saying something. And he says, shut that shit up, little nigga, where are you from? Right? Now, people know that <laughs> in the valley is the valley. Now, not to say the valley is soft in any means. There's a lot of killings and jackings and this and that, and they have their own gangs. But L.A. is where gangs are, really, in California. You know what I mean? Compton, this and that. One of the guys that was the, um, he was John's guy for us to kind of, you know, uh, uh, kind of mimic or or just get our, our influence from as far as what he wants out of this role was a cat named Big Cat from 6 Old Crip. So I had met him already, but that was it. Just kind of shook his hand, whatever. And then we were doing our rehearsals. So anyway, so flash forward to him and he's saying it in my face and he's like, man, shut your little ass up. He said, where you from, punk? I said, this is, I'm from 6 Old Crip. He said, shut up, bitch. You from the valley. <laughs> I, and I looked at him kind of like, is he serious? You know? And he said, what you going to do? You standing there, what you going to do? And I said, I said, bang, you dead. And he said, bitch, there ain't no guns. What the fuck are you going to do? And I remember I looked down at A.J. Johnson, who played the mom, and she looked at me like, what you going to do? <laughs> so I said, I said, bang, bang. And he said, damn, ain't guns. And he slapped my hands, picked me up, slams me on the floor. And initially, again, I'm young, 24, I was like, what? You ain't doing shit. And I kind of, kind of got the better of him for like three seconds. And then that man strength kicked in <laughs> and he had me down on the ground and he was sweating and holding me down. And I'm, I'm still in character and I'm fired up and all. But I'm like, oh, shit, I can't move now. You know what I mean? He's got me. And John is just holding that camera like, no, oh, let's see where this goes. I'll never forget. I wriggled my hands free and his face was right here. And I grabbed his forehead and I kissed. I said, cut, nigga. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, that's how we stopped. You know, I stood up and everybody, and John was like, all right, man, let's good rehearsal. See y'all tomorrow. And he walks off and, uh, and and I remember we were just getting ready to leave and Ving walks over to me and says, damn, what'd you do? Take acting class overnight? He was like a different person today. And I was like, well, he called me out and this and that and the third. And, um, and even then, I was fired up again. I was locked in and focused, but I didn't have uh, the sweet pea look just yet. So he wanted me to hang out with Shout out again to um, Big Cat. And Big Cat said, look, man, I've been watching you do your thing. You got the look. You look the part. But all that yelling and shit, that ain't it. You know what I mean? And then John was like, yeah, no, he's right. What you got to do is you got to internalize all that shit. So learn it. It's kind of like in Rocky Three when uh, Rocky loses and then Apollo takes him to his gym and he says, see that look? You got to get the eye of the tiger. And I'll never forget, he really, you know, he took me, sorry, we going to your hood. I'll never forget, right? He said, look, I'm going to take you to my hood, meet some of my dudes. Now, I got your back, but if some shit go down, don't be no weenie. <laughs> and I was like, nah. Like, I almost wanted to start some shit to prove that. And this is just like going, I remember we went to like City Walk or something. I'd be looking like, I wish somebody would. We went to his hood. This is his hood. I don't, he's just gangbang. I don't shit him. Yes, sir. But, um. I'm doing like he said. I'm just paying attention. Shut the fuck up. I'm doing playing off, you know. As people, you cool. It, they're humans. You know what I'm saying? But if you come on there tripping, that's your ass. You know what I'm saying? So I knew I was with him. I was cool. And we never got into nothing. There's no stories about that. But I think from the time of soaking it up with him and then the chip on my shoulder, the other chip that I had 
was people would come on set like, oh man, I hear you playing Sweet Pea. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go, uh-huh. all right, I can't wait till he say action, you know? And, um, and that kind of locked me in. And then when we were filming, the first scene we filmed was the garage scene where I tell, uh, where my character tells Tyree's character that he wants to be saved. And um, if you watch the scene, he's already intense. I mean, for most of the movie, he's always intense. But John Singleton was like, look, man, this is the scene I'm sending to, to uh, Paramount. Like, this is it. We're just getting started here. They got to see this and go, yep, you got a movie. Let's keep going here. Some more money. I need you jumping up and down, do some push ups, some jumping jacks, whatever. I want your heart beating out your chest before I say action. So that's what I did. And I remember I always, so I even to this day, if I get ready to do a rod, get down and do some hub, so much, just, mm, he say action. I'm almost, almost out of breath. You know what I mean? But the look was there, the mindset was there. And once we got through with that scene, the rest of the movie, in my opinion, was easy as far as, you know what I mean? That was the toughest part, was just getting the look now. Now, was that the scene we talked about how you leave the house at nine and come back at six and yeah. pretend like you're doing something? Absolutely. Can you can you reenact that somewhat? Because I just really love that scene. No, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I try. <laughs> I try. No, I mean, it, it's just the thing is. It was just so poignant. You know what I mean? Because really, yeah. as a man, you could, you know, like, wow, like so you're wrong. living here with this woman. Who's yeah. Basically, her and her mother is taking care of you. Yeah. So you leave the house at nine to pretend to go to work yeah, and come home at six while you're basically doing nothing all day, yeah. pretending like you just did something, yeah. knowing you didn't do nothing. You have no money in your pocket. <laughs> yeah. You got to depend on a woman when you're a man. It's just, you know, it's a it's, crushing it, kind, no, of, it's, kind of feeling, you know? It all is hats off to John Singleton, man. Now, when I talked about the rehearsing, jumping around in the cut and all that, that was our time to improv. After that, it was, here's the script, <laughs> stick to the script. Word by word. Word by word. That's how John was. When it says written by John Singer, it's written. Not written by John and improvs a little bit. Nah, you had your chance to get all your little extras, you know, in the rehearsals. But when it's locked in, it was locked in. So all of those words, man, it was, you know, we you read it and then you give it to him. And if he likes it, bam. If he doesn't, he'll tell you, do this, do that, or step the fuck up, <laughs> you know. And uh, yeah, it's best motivator ever. You, know, you mentioned you got into it with Ving Rhames, but there was like three physical altercations with Ving Rhames during the course of rehearsals? In the rehearsals, yeah. I mean, like I said, the first, I wouldn't say three. It was because you don't you know, touch a man too fucking much, dude. The first time I just remember that I was so, at, you know, in his face with it that I remember we fell down. And I remember thinking, oh, he ain't that strong. That's what, that's what I was thinking. I was like, I, what do you do? Blah, blah, blah. Because he's sitting there like, man, if you don't knock it off. But I was fully, you know, I was motivated. I was mad as hell. So I felt like I got the better of him the first time. And the second time he was just like, all right, man, enough is enough. Let me <laughs> show your little ass now, you know. Uh, but yeah. Okay. Uh, and, you know, you had some, some very classic scenes in there. Mm-hmm. You know, like the whole scene of when you were in the house, you're like, y'all some unstable ass creatures. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to call so y'all bitches. Right. I'm going to call mm-hmm. y'all creatures. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's the whole scene of you trying to sell a dress. Mm. The worst salesman ever. Ever, yeah. <laughs> he had her for a second and then <laughs> messed, second, it all messed it all up. Like Tyra Banks. He's like, okay. And you know, there's the whole, uh, mm. what are you good at? Robbing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, when uh, Jody gets robbed, where he gets beat up, yeah. he just jumped for, yeah. for his bike. Yeah. Uh, I'm stepping out. Some you guys, yeah, you guys ended up lining the kids up and yeah. just punching them in the face one yeah. after another. And you yeah. ended up actually whooping the last kid with a belt. Whooping the last kid with a belt. Yeah, in rehearsals, I actually hit him with the belt a couple of times. He yeah. had to come to my trailer and say, excuse me, uh, bro, can you not hit me for real with that? But look at these whips you left on the side. And they actually went out and got a fake belt for us to use, a foam belt. Looked just like a belt. So for the rest, I was at it at the pull nothing because it was just bah. But uh, yeah. Yeah, and then at the end you end up actually killing Snoop Dogg. Yeah, yeah. Does that get awkward sometimes. Y'all hanging out like, <laughs> damn, I'll fucking kill me. <laughs> what you here for? I want to hang out with you. Ah, that's funny. <laughs> that's some funny shit. And you know what's funny? I've worked with Snoop a bunch of times since then. Hmm. I mean, a bunch of times. I did a series called Playmakers for ESPN, and everybody wanted to be on this show. When I say everybody, they were like, "Yo, Fifty Cent want to come on and do the show." But this was before his. Uh, acting career really took off before he even made his own movie. But I was like, but that's 50 Cent. Let him come on. I remember saying, why ain't, why? And they're like, well, they don't think he'll this, he'll that. I'm like, well, I didn't regret it, that shit. And then Snoop 
called and said he wanted to be on. And he he actually did an episode where he played my brother, which was funny as hell. But, uh, but I mean, it was dope. It was dope. He did a good job. He's always been um, very professional and good. He like knowing his lines. It, it, it amazes the shit out of me. I actually wound up doing a play called Redemption of a Dog for Snoop. This ran like uh, a couple of years ago. We went and did a little tour for about six months. And that was, that was, again, another long interview. But the boy up here, the memory on this man, he's like, oh, well, I'm a rapper. Of course I remember. I was like, okay. I was like, put it like that. He made us all step our game up. Well, you know, John Singleton died, yeah. you know, not too long ago. Yeah. You heard the news. He was still very young. Yeah. Was he in his 50s? Yes, he yeah. was. 50, uh, I want to say five, but yeah. Yeah. And you heard the news. I mean, did you guys maintain any sort of relationship or contact? Sure. Um, just to be completely honest, Yes and no. Because again, I don't hang out, like socialize with people unless they're a part of my clique. That's just me. That's just how I was. I've since, I mean, even though, you know, we could talk about a lot of stuff that happened on the set of Baby Boy, um, that because of that, I kind of change how I am when I meet a new cast and that I try to hang out a little bit more. That role, with everything that I felt I had to prove, with what I knew it could potentially do for my career and for my life, I wanted to focus on that. Now, the girl that played my girlfriend in the movie, we actually started dating. I had known her, I'd met her before, but then, you know, with movies, it's funny, you'll meet a lot of, you'll hear about a lot of actors and actresses that start dating because the director wants there to be a real connection. I remember in high school, I got the lead role opposite a girl who I was not attracted to in any way. And there was an exercise that we did where we look into each other's eyes and we give each other a compliment about anything. Nice hair, nice earrings, nice nose, nice chin. And we did this like 12 or 15 times back and forth. And by the end of it, we was ready to start kissing. It's just something about connecting with somebody on that level where it's acting or not. So other than this girl, uh, Angel Conwell is her name too. Shout out to Angel. Um, who, you know, like I said, wound up being my girlfriend for a few years afterwards. Everybody else, it was just work for me, you know? And I think a riff became between um oh well, it wasn't uh, i think what happened when we actually stood off face to face and yelled at each other about it uh between me and tyrese was because he wanted somebody to really you know he's like man this is my first role this is my thing would you come over to my house and just hang out stay a couple nights like let's you know be, build this bond of friendship and this and that and i kind of looked at him like no nigga i'll see you on set like i don't <laughs> do all that like that's just how i was like you know we can hang out when we're on set but no and he took offense to that and um, you couldn't tell when you see the movie. I mean, we, you know, as actors, we acted. But him and John were like brothers. So I think it was one of those things where I wasn't close with John because I wasn't close with Tyrese. Mm. You understand okay. what I'm saying? So, like, they actually filmed a music video. You just the baby. Boy, everybody in the cast was in the movie except this guy. <laughs> you know, I was like, I got a call from my girlfriend at the time. You know, they filming the, the, the video right around the corner from your house. <laughs> I was like, what? You know, I pull up with the homies and hop out. Like, what's going on here and all that, you know, again. But it was cool. I, I I just, I didn't come to disrupt. I just come to kind of look everybody in their face like, that's how it is kind of thing. And then went on about my business. Um, but yeah, with John, though, you know, it was never animosity or this and that. It's just, uh, you know, I didn't hang with him. That's just what it was. I see him from time to time. I never worked with him again. But I did see him like when my brother did um, the OJ uh, mm, when right. he played OJ so the after party for that was oh my god you think we was all kissing cousins we was hugging and laughing. everybody was happy like hey you know and I remember he took a picture with us uh, with both of us and he's and, you know snaps that he's like I started both of these guys career we like you sure did like, I love you you know <laughs> always love it and uh, when my son was born we were at a park uh, it was like a little music festival and uh, everybody had their blankets out, blah, blah, blah. And a girl walked over and she said, hey, my dad wanted to say hi to you. And I'm like, oh, a fan. She's like, yeah, he's right over there. John, John Singleton. I was like, oh, shit, really? You know, and I came over. I was like, what up, man? Big hug and meet my son. And, you know, he got, he got a great picture with him and the three of us. And my son looked at him. He just curious look like, it's you. I said, like, we owe that boy a lot. That man a lot, rather. Um, I think that was the last time I saw him. Though. Yeah. I mean, he went on to do Snowfall, which was like my favorite TV <gasps> series at that. You know, whenever Snowfall yeah. is on, that's my favorite thing to watch. Yeah. I absolutely love it. I, I, it almost I was, was like, like, like I was a prequel late to, party, to Boys man, but it's great. You know what's funny? <laughs> it's funny you say that. Yeah. When I watched it, I went, hmm, interesting. It's kind of got the storyline, yeah. Yeah. Boys in the Hood. But the dynamic with him and his best friend felt more like baby boy to me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, to me, because I'm looking at him going, he 
interesting. But he always had that one-two punch kind of thing. You got the lead dude, and then you got the homie that gets the work, the puts in the work type of thing. But that was an oh, was excellent, excellent show. Well, you mentioned playmakers. Mm. And I guess, you know, the series was going, mm. but then ESPN ended up canceling it because the NFL disliked the way that NFL players were being portrayed in the show. Yeah. And it got canceled because of that. Is that accurate? Absolutely. What happened was from the beginning. Now, it's on ESPN. So ESPN said, okay, you got this show about football, inside look at football. And um, the NFL already doesn't like it. But we've committed to the show. Let's put it on. However, we want you to never mention NFL in your interviews. Now, we filmed it in Toronto, Canada. We, we were out there. So we used the CFL, all of their football players and whatnot. So when they met, when we did interviews, we were like, yeah, no, CFL, CFL, not, not that other one. Like They were like, don't even say NFL in the interviews. So we knew from jump that it was like, and they said, look, y'all got to kill it for one. If the better you do, the better your chances at season two. And obviously, the success, if people are loving it and if the ratings are good. Ratings were excellent. The ra- It was for that six month, maybe to a year. T- oh, no, it had to be a year. We were out there for six months. I remember we all watched the first episode in a bar together out there while we were still filming it. So we were still filming and the first episode came on. And we said, damn, like I, that was one of the proudest other than I think like Baby Boy. But I watched, I said, damn, this show is good. But I didn't, I still didn't know because we were in Canada, how much it hit. Well, let me tell you something. When I got home, I went to Vegas, one place I used to love to go since I was like 17. My dad took me, I was 17, and another long story. But I would always go to Vegas, and I went to Vegas, one of my favorite hotels, I'm not even sure which one, I think it was like Sahara at the time, whatever it was, and I went inside to, I don't know, maybe grab a drink, something really simple, and some guy said, oh, that's DH from Playmakers. Got mobbed. I mean, like mob mobbed. Like I've never seen that level towards me of any, anybody, even in Vegas, like, oh, there goes such and such over there. They went nuts. Like I had security had to get me out of there. It was so crazy. It was so popular at that time. Um, but we finished the season and we were just, you know, season two going to be this. We're going to do this. And what we all these plans. And they were just like, nah, it just, it's not happening. And I was like, well, the ratings bad. They were like, the ratings were terrific. Hmm. You made millions and millions of dollars for ESPN. However, there's a billion dollar <laughs> in the NFL. NFL. So what would you do? And they're like, yeah, I guess that that was it. Crazy. Mm. Uh, and then in 2005, you were in the Barbershop TV <laughs> series, <laughs> which was a spinoff from, you know, the Barbershop, movies. the movie. Yeah. And I think the demise of that show, which also was a one season and done, was if you look at the fan base of Barbershop, the movie, it's a PG-13 at best. You understand? Mm-hmm. So it's wholesome. You can bring the whole family and everything. The TV show we did was on Showtime. Showtime doesn't do PG-13. No. Showtime, this was like NC-17. You know, it was, it was sex, drugs, violence. It was everything. And as funny as it was, it was just a, their fan, their original fan base was like, get out of here. You know, I remember the red carpet. I got the, uh, that was the second time I saw Ice Cube. He looked exactly the same level of meme. <laughs> he was the same mean on the, I was like, brother, can we get, never a smile. No. Okay. Uh, but yeah, that was fun as hell, man. Did that at uh, uh, the Paramount, back to Paramount Studios. We did that for one season. I uh, got paid stupid, stupid money. And it was like, well, this is going to go forever. Now, like, well, it's not ratings. It's Showtime. Showtime is just uh-huh. subscribe to Showtime. We'll decide what stays and what goes. But um, but yeah, but that ended. I was, I was kind of surprised at that. Well, uh, your brother, Cuba Gooding Jr. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michael Jai White, who's a, a friend of mine, a regular on the show. I love him. Uh, he told me that his nickname, the Cuba's g- nickname is Butt Naked. <laughs> he said that he I has don't been deny, at, I don't, I don't doubt that. events with Cuba where he just had to leave. <laughs> he just had to Him walk out. Him and me both. Cuba's a, Cuba's a wild boy. Like, that, that's, never been, that's never been hidden. You know, yeah. his nickname that he would tell everybody is Butt Naked. What? <laughs> I never knew about no, this. No, you, you can Google that. Cuba said that himself. Because he, he gets naked. Like, he, for 20 years, he just would drop trial in public. He would expose right. himself. Yeah, yeah, he would do, he did that a lot. He's just, you know, he's a wild guy that way. Um, okay. Yeah, he, he was, a, he was, you know, he's, he calls himself that, right? So, he, you know, uh, I saw... That's something that nowadays is completely frowned upon, of course. So I'm not, 
when I say I'm not surprised, it's not because he's a lecherous person. I I just think people are just they're they're on a witch hunt for it to some degree. Who knows? Yeah, he might. Who knows? He may have crossed the line. I, I've never been drunk a day in my life. I know that your inhibitions are gone. And if he's all, he's kind of wild anyway. He drops drops his draws just. So I you, just think you know. Wait, okay, so it, yeah, hold on, I'll, hold on. Yeah. I just, I just want to. Yeah. I've never even heard about this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, I'm looking on E Online. You know, Cuba Gooding Jr. drops his shorts. Yeah. Like, what year is that? <laughs> this was 2014. No, oh, come on. He's been doing that for a long. Well, this is yeah, just yeah, one yeah, article that just yeah. came up during a Google yeah. search. So yeah. So wait, have a, you been around him when he just suddenly just dropped his pants? I'm, and I'm asking this question in the most heterosexual way possible right now. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not, no, no, no. But no, I know him to do that in public. That's the whole thing. Okay. You know what I mean? But it, it, at the time, it wasn't, it was just, oh, look how crazy Cuba is. Like, he's just, he's on that shit. He's, just, he's, he's wild. I was at a bachelor party that he, he given, and I had to leave. You know, <laughs> I'm not thinking like none of this. Cuba, I remember the first- Have you heard that nickname before? It actually rings a bell. I remember there was a nightclub in Hollywood that was, oh, it was the shit. It was like the hardest nightclub to ever even get in. I've been in like twice. And I was in there like, they're like, yeah, your brother just left. He left his clothes over there, but he just left. He had like an ice bucket around his ball and was jumping up. I was just like, damn, what? And the first time I actually hung out, hung out with him in my adult years was we went to Vancouver. And he was filming a movie and I showed up out there, me and my buddy. And he, I just was like, damn, I felt like the security. Like I wanted to, you know, I'm the younger brother by nine years. I'm like, bruh, you know, and it, it, and regardless of the trouble that he got in legally and everything there, it was never that. It was always him having a damn ball, but just himself. Like, we, you, you seen it and here it is. And like, thank you. We've seen it. Could you get dressed, please? But it was just, it, you know, it's just his personality. Yeah. He's got so much energy. He can't bottle that shit. It's just. It, that's just how he is all the time. But he's here, you know, I'll go, oh man, it's Omar, it's funny as hell. And he did it out. My brother comes out and just be like, it's my brother. You know, that's, it's my big bro. So it's always like. Yeah, I remember Marlon Wayans posted a picture of your brother <laughs> with a KFC bucket. On oh his shit, yes. <laughs> he said, I know some crazy motherfuckers, but this motherfucker yeah. is the craziest motherfucker I know. He only had to try. He is just nonstop, man. He's nonstop. But you know, that's his, that's his energy. Well, you know, you fast forward a couple of years, mm -hmm. I think right around 2019, yeah. uh, 22 women accused him of sexual assault. He's going through his whole Me Too kind of movement right now. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you heard about that, and that's your big brother who you yeah. look up to, what'd yeah. you think? Uh, I remember when I heard about it, I was like, I think I was just a little numb to it because of, you know, I could see if it was the first time an actor or a man of color or whatever has been accused of something like that or whatever, then maybe it'd have been like, what the hell, man? But when I first heard the accusation, I was like, interesting. And I remember I was at a bar. Um, well, it was a sports bar, but it was, it was like hangout bar. But anyway, and they had the TVs on and it said, up next, breaking news, Cuba Gooding Jr. We have the tape. And I was like, oh, shit. And I remember I stood up and I'm like staring at the screen, waiting to see this footage. And they show him sitting there and they were like, they circled him like, here's Cuba here. And here comes the girl that accused him. And she sits next to him. And then he goes, what? There's something, something. And he's got his girlfriend or whatever on his left. And he kind of goes like this to her. And you see his hand go up, maybe as high as her chin. And then back in his lap. And that was it. And then he gets up and walks off. And then the next footage, you see the girl walking pat and behind him after this so-called. And then they cut to the anchors and they're just like, yeah, there you have it. Oh, it's uh, it's crazy, man. I loved him in this. And then I'm like, what the fuck did we just watch? Yeah. yeah. What I know the what hell mean. did he do? I saw that tape and I'm like, I don't see what he did wrong. Like, I actually don't see what he did, period. Actually, this. You know, I was expecting him to be throwing the girl Dude, down. And, you know, ripping her hair out. Or or how we used to dance back <laughs> in the day. Something. Right, something. And then when they said it was, the charge was inappropriate touching, I was just like, dude, you know how many people you can lock up with that charge? That oh. is insanity. It just, maybe if we never saw the footage, then we can just say, okay, man, he probably did some crazy shit. But 
Yeah, no. The I fact that the what we saw, I didn't I just, see anything. Like I'm like, I don't. It's, he just kind of reached over and almost like he shook her hand or, or something. Like it, it, it really didn't look like it, it really anything. didn't look like nothing, man. This, this Me Too shit is really it's wild, man. I, I'm just waiting for them to make an example of one of these accusers because it just seems like you can just accuse somebody and that's it. Fuck their whole life up and you, you know, going back to yours. So. Yes, yeah, it's, it's wild, man. It's wild. And then when people, like you said, people start coming up. Now it's 22 women. Really? Is it? You know, they're like, but if they're handing out checks, me too. I know he did something. I mean, if you list what his charge is as inappropriate touching, you'll probably be 122 girls. I could say, oh, well, shit, he did that to me too. Like, yeah, what's uh, half for the, anyway. Yeah, no, I feel you. And I guess I mean, recently he's, uh, he's accused of ignoring the lawsuit and he's facing a $6 million judgment. Yeah, that was uh, interesting. You know, and I, I mean, a lot of times it's a money grab. I'm not saying yeah. this never happens. I'm yeah. not saying women do not get sexually assaulted or raped well, sure. or whatever, but. But that's the sad part for the ones that actually do get assaulted. Yeah. And then you got, you know, well, you know. Yeah. So it's tough. It's tough. I mean, yeah, he, his lawyers are not my lawyers. His yeah. people that advise him to do what and do what. That's his, his thing. I'm, uh, it's tough, man. I mean, like even in the beginning, I was just like, okay, he's turning, turning himself in. I look at him as me, but nine years ago, nine years before I was born. Like we had same mother, same father. That could have been me. And you know what? He's like, it's me. That's the thing about, you know, siblings. It's like, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, so <laughs> I hate to do it, but I, you know, I just, it's like, it's better than you to me. Because it would have been a different story. Like, all right, I'm, I'm turning myself in. All right, cool. Turn around. Turn around for what? So you can put these handcuffs on. Excuse me? I got to get handcuffed? I'm already here. No, no. You got to do the perp walk. We got people out here. And then even if we do get to that, now he's turning and smiling at people. When I saw the, him smiling with the handcuffs, I just was like, bruh. I, God bless you. Uh, I just, I, I couldn't do it. Especially innocent. Like, fuck out of here. I mean, if you had a conversation with him, like, how's he holding up with all these charges? No. Honesty? No, I have not. Honesty, Um, we spoke vaguely. You know, kind of in, yeah, man, you good? Nah, I'm good. You know, these, my, you know, that type of thing. Right. But it wasn't like, man, I did this and da da da. Because him and I, newsflash, are not that kind of close. There's a big age difference. There's a big age difference. You hit it right on the nail. And that's why it was always bigger brother, father role type of thing. Dad's out, you listening to me, beat your ass. How come you ain't come on, home on time and the lights ain't on? That type of shit. You know what I mean? But it was for me, it's love. It's a big brother. You know, and from him, it's, I think it's different. It's like he's raising another kid type of thing. So we never really, it wasn't until I got married and had kids and he had, and then we had really something to talk about that we really started bonding. They're like, man, let me tell you about these women. You're going to come across this and da, 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 da. And when your kid gets this way, da, da. And girls are different than little boys and that, you know, and I love that. I'm just sitting there like, bring it. I need to hear about all this shit. Um, then I try to tell him, all right, now can you stay off of TMZ? Yeah. You know, like, no. <laughs> and you know, you he killed it. Playing OJ, by the way. Ah, yeah, no pun intended. Killed. Yeah. Did, did yeah. he get an award for that? Did he get? Any? He should have. I think he got. Uh, I did think he was nominated. He was nominated for that. Okay, on that one, they didn't. Yeah, he's like, you can't, you can't give. You got to get the Oscar, man. I'll be great. Right, and OJ's out now. <laughs> <laughs> I remember there was a video circling around where OJ's like, "Yeah, people got to see these hands when I get out." Ah! Like, <laughs> yeah, right. I was sure you don't want that. That boy, that boy got hands for real. That's funny. You know, everybody lists my brother's favorite movies to them. To me, Men of Honor is up there. Um, but one of my personal favorites was a movie called Gladiator that not a lot of people saw. The lead was uh, a guy that was in, remember a show called Twin Peaks? Mm -hmm. and it was like a cult classic. Yeah. So the lead guy, he played the lead in this. He's very monotone, this and that. And did But my brother took boxing. And if you watch this movie, he's that guy in the movie. And uh, it was awesome. But he kept that shit up. So <laughs> everybody talk shit. Hey, keep talking, say, don't say it too close. You find out quick. These goodings have hands. I'm just saying. Omar Goody, man. I appreciate you coming in, sharing your story, man. You got some classics yes, under sir. your belt. Yes, sir. You know, uh, like I said, before coming in, mm -hmm. you know, meeting with you today, I rewatched Baby Boy, mm -hmm. you know, right. to really, you know, kind of remind myself yeah. how good that movie was. Yeah, it was good. You it know, and good. it's still to this day, it's a cult classic. Oh, yeah. Shout out to BET. Because it didn't do well in the box office. Oh, it didn't? No, no. Huh. It just went. You know, it was just one of those movies that, no, you did a movie? Yeah, whatever. But uh, BET played the hell out of them. It's on right now. It didn't show five times while we've been talking. I mean, that happens a lot with a lot of black movies, it seems. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, yeah. like uh, the five heartbeats I heard just bombed at the, at the box office. Did. And now it's hmm? become like people's 
favorite movie. Yeah. Well, it's been tough for, uh, you know, black actors to kind of get, I don't, know, I don't know if we want to go down that road, but I think lately leading men, black actors have been showing that they can hold down and make money in the box office. So things have changed a lot. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think back then it was like, okay, this is a black movie. Mm -hmm. Only black people are going to see it. All right. We're going to just, you know, marketing only to the black communities and yeah. black audiences and because no one else is going to watch it. But do you remember Boys in the Hood, Menace to Society, what would happen in movie theaters? There was shootings. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So especially like when Bayboy come out, people weren't even watching it in the theater. Like, I'm not even going to try that. Right. So there is that stigma too, but There's that's that, what's happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. Omar, man, appreciate you coming in. Until next time. <laughs> yes, sir. Peace. My man.